an original MCM production. Uh, I'm Dennis Coyce. I'm the president and CEO of the Milwaukee Public Museum. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout, and this continues what we have already learned and uh, seen with streets, which is this exhibit and this uh, reimagining is generating huge community interest and participation and excitement. And this weekend we had our member preview. The first member preview day sold out, so we had to add a second member preview day. Uh, and I believe this weekend we had close to 6,000 people, give or take, in the museum just for the member preview. Um, and that is in advance of the December 11th public opening of streets. Uh, so I hope uh, you will enjoy the little preview and sneak peek behind the scenes today that Julian and Al are going to provide. This is the third in our series of lunch and lecture series talks. Uh, and I'm really excited to uh, introduce you to Al and Julian for those of you who don't know these two gentlemen. So they are the uh, key forces behind the reimagining of streets. It took, you will hear from them, a team of many and really the whole museum to get behind this project and make it happen. Uh, but fundamentally, these two gentlemen are the visionaries that uh, got this project rolling and got it completed on time and on budget, which is a miracle in the museum world. Um, and, you know, they're going to be very, um, uh, you know, sort of modest today, but I will tell you that this is a project that curatorially, design-wise, should have probably taken about three years for a museum like this to do. Um, we should have started this uh, back in 2011 or 12, done the fundraising, spent lots of time designing and talking about it, built the plans, got the whole thing done and opened it. Uh, this year. And instead, what we did is we compressed it and did it all in less than a year. And that includes uh, all the design work, all the history work, all the objects, the conservation, the fundraising. Uh, all of that was completed and completed successfully in less than a year, which is a wonderful testament to the capabilities of this museum, the staff here, and of this community. So. <laughs> So uh, let me just give you a little introductory background here. So Al Muchka is our Curator of History Collections and Senior Collections Manager. Uh, Al has been a longtime employee of the museum and actually came out of the Museum Studies Program uh, at UWM in 1991, which is a, a co-program, co-run program with UWM and the Milwaukee Public Museum. That is where he received a Master of Arts degree in American History and Certificate in Museum Studies from UWM. Uh, he also holds a certification in nonprofit management from Carroll University. Uh, and Al is our material culture guy. He does all of our history, all of our material culture studies and collections documentation and interpretation. Um, and he has great and broad expertise. Many of you know this. You can ask Al about just about anything. And he has fascinating things to tell you about your question. Uh, he knows a great deal about firearms technology, decorative arts, local Americana, Milwaukee history. Uh, and he's developed lots of exhibits at this museum, as well as lots of exhibits around the community. So he's had a wide impact in this city. And he has also been a past instructor in the MPM, UWM Museum Studies Joint Certificate Program. And then we're going to be uh, joined by Julian Jackson, who is the recently arrived Director of Exhibits and Design for the Milwaukee Public Museum. He's been here just over a year. He oversees all the exhibits design, all of the graphic design. Uh, he's working on a lot of the digital media projects that you see as well. Uh, before joining MPM last year, Julian was the Director of Experience Design at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Uh, and prior to that, he co-led his own company, which focused on interactive experiences in physical environments. Uh, Julian, this is not widely known, has illustrated 40 books uh, in his copious free time. Um, and it was an instructor in the Graduate Human Computer Interaction Program at DePaul University and has been a frequent speaker nationally on immersive experience design. Uh, so we're going to start with Al, and then he will be followed by Julian. So please join me in welcome to the podium, Al Muchka. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm very happy to see you all here this morning with us. Um, your presence here is a testament to the longevity of the streets of Old Milwaukee and the huge interest in local history and the collections of the museum. 
Um, this is our 50th anniversary celebration and a little bit of a busman's tour of the history of the streets of Old Milwaukee. Um, the exhibit itself is 50 years old, but very, very few people understand that the original street exhibit idea goes back to the 1930s. Uh, one of the biggest things that happened is we started acquiring a lot of really great local history collections, and many of the politicians in the area, especially men like Alderman Carl Dietz and County Supervisor Fred Heath, were very, very interested in what was going on in the streets of, in the museum itself, but were more so interested interested in preserving the memory of the neighborhoods, the businesses, and the innovation that was going on in Milwaukee in the 19th century. So over the years, it's been looked at several different times. Uh, curator in 1946, uh, the real first history curator for the museum was Eldon Wolf, and he really started writing about this as part of what was going on for the planning for a new museum building. And this is one of the early concept sketches, and this one actually includes the Schlemmer automobile. So a lot of the ideas that were floating around really did center on that innovative uh, Milwaukee aspect. In the 1950s, then, it was revisited, and we see a little bit of a vignette, a concept vignette from the um, mid-1950s that came out in a lore article that was used to really promote the idea of building a new museum and then filling it with immersive types of exhibits. Again, here's a, what the museum should have looked like back in, in the 1950s, and we're not terribly far off these days. The very first street staff really did consist of um, the museum's prime uh, historian, Eldon Wolf, and uh, designer Ed Green, and scientific assistant Bob Leitz. They were all responsible for the conception of the basic exhibit and the gathering of uh, materials, especially collections from local people. This is one of the pr wonderful opportunities of the 1950s and early 1960s is the museum really had a wonderful, wonderful chance to get out in the community, work with community leaders, work with businessmen, but more so really deal with individuals and families that have all kinds of bits and pieces of Milwaukee and American history in their basements. So what was the streets of old Milwaukee? What were we really trying to cover? It was an emotive view of Milwaukee, but a very compact, compressed view. Um, it was really based on business and neighborhood, and it was uh, really meant to show off the innovative cultures of the local businesses. We really rely very strongly on the Americana collection and the local history collection, but it just wasn't one of those collections where you put objects up and just said, we're good with it and walk away. They really wanted to make this like home. So you were immersed in what was going on in the exhibit. You could walk up, press your nose against the window, leave a big old nose print, but actually really get to see what was inside of, of every unit. Construction of the uh, streets of Old Milwaukee began after about 22 days of design. Uh, Ed Green was uh, just a fantastic, is a fantastic designer, and was just really motivated by the whole notion of the streets of Old Milwaukee, as as was uh, Wolf and Leitz. But he did his design work in 22 days, and immediately after that, in November 1962, they started swinging hammers. Our streets of Old Milwaukee covers Grand Avenue which is today Wisconsin uh, Avenue, Chestnut Street, which is Juneau, um, River Street, which is Edison, right along the river, and then Biddle Street, which is today East Kilburn. Many of the materials that came from these particular areas were actually used and incorporated in the streets of Old Milwaukee, but recut to fit our three-quarter scale. The streets of Old Milwaukee opened in January of 1965 with 21, ex uh, 21 exhibit units. Uh, the streets was under constant change. It's one of those things that I don't think anybody was really going to let grass grow under their feet. So you always had little changes. If it wasn't collections, small collections changes or object changes to uh, kind of refocus interpretation, there were outright new units. Uh, one of the early new units was the Mater's unit and then followed by the Conrad Schmidt Studio, the Paleman Bakery. Um, and then later, Roundy's, Harnischweger, and the Watson family. Um, the saloon, as you can see, 
was, uh, was uh, actually renovated to become a Tide saloon. And that's one of the saloons that was beholden to a particular brewery. Uh, they, were supplied, they were supplied with all of, the, uh, all of the drinkables from that brewery, but the brewery also supplied all of the equipment that a bar would need. So the tables, the chairs, the glasses, uh, match boxes, everything. If, you, if, if it needed, was needed in a tavern, they, they supplied it. Uh, we used to go through seasonal changes quite a bit. Uh, into the early 1990s, there were a number of uh, Christmas uh, changes that would go on. Um, that, as uh, as some of the as we had some retrenchment of staff, and uh, we actually really considered what was going on in the streets of Old Milwaukee being a late summer, early fall situation. We kind of ceased the idea of uh, uh, seasonal decoration. But then we shared that whole thing with the uh, European village a little later in the 1990s when we decided that the European village was really going to be our Christmas spot and that the streets of Old Milwaukee was going to host the uh, Halloween events. Street staff after the 1980s, we had John Lundstrom, my predecessor, and Vern Kamholtz, uh, both very talented uh, uh, and very strong-willed men. They had some very interesting ideas. Uh, they were largely responsible for many of the small exhibit changes that I mentioned just a minute ago. Um, years and years of being loved, yeah. Um, normally museum exhibits really only last about 10, maybe 15 years. But the Streets of Old Milwaukee is one of those exhibits that because you could actually get inside of it, you could become part of it. And all of the bits and pieces and all of the stories that were told really came from the people of Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin. So it was one of those things that nobody ever really wanted it to go away. It was always there. It became iconic. Um, throughout the ch changing times, though, um, uh, ideas passed on, the people that originated the uh, streets of Old Milwaukee passed on, and a lot of people that really had the, the prime memory. Um, in 1965, this was really you know, kind of the world of, of the parents of the people who created this exhibit. So uh, those people were gone. So we were talking to their sons and daughters and eventually their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and maybe now in some instances their great-great-grandchildren. So we had a little bit of generational fade going on there. So um, I mean today's 12-year-old kind of looks at the streets of old Milwaukee and goes, um, and most people in their 20s probably think of it as an antiques roadshow bit. Um, <laughs> But largely, there's a lot of information there, and that's one of the great things about it. Through education programs, through events across the museum for many, many years, everybody remembers the streets of old Milwaukee. And so it is, over 50 years, it's kind of been loved into a position of needing a serious, serious remake. Holy cow, yeah, 50 years. We knew it was coming. The administration really got behind it. Um, and it was a very short time. Um, Julian came on last year, and he and I started talking about it in the fall, and we really didn't get moving on it until March. So we did all of the concept work, all the historical research, object selections. Our collection staff did the object cleaning and object registration. And all of that was done along with the construction between March and the end of November this yeah, end of November. So it was a huge, huge job. So we were behind the eight ball a lot like the original makers with 22 days experience or uh, 22 days of design and just a little bit more than a year in, in the making. But one of the big things that really came out when we started uh, the process and announced that we were going to be doing something with the streets was uh, many people in the area just, there was this hue and cry, don't change our streets. What are you gonna do? Don't put TV screens in there. Don't do this, don't do that. And we really did listen to that. And working with Julian was just a wonderful experience for me in that respect because there were, he, he had a lot of things in mind that would make the technology immersive as well. It wouldn't be in your face, it would be behind the scenes, it would be just one of those wonderful things that would give you those little twinklings off to the side or something that would pop up in front of you or, or uh, later on the interpretive materials that we wrote with regard to the app and the characters. So the reimagined theme Keep the streets the same, but make them modern. So essentially, it was a major, major cleanup. Um, we did take out the Clinton Rose case and several storage, small storage areas and the French colonial exhibits on the opposite side of the streets of Old Milwaukee to create about 600 extra square feet. 
And in that, we decided that we were going to be looking at uh, a little bit of the touch of industry that the streets of old Milwaukee really didn't have. So as partners with the museum popped up and we had the ability to talk with some of them and find out their histories and kind of pull that together, we added things like the Falk Corporation and Northside Lumber, which is today Blifford Lumber, and uh, the Sendix, uh, Sendix uh, Markets, uh, which started in the early 1900s as, as a push cart service. So as you can see here, this is, a con uh, this is one of our early design sketches for the streets of Old Milwaukee, and this is the front end. This is the new front end, what we call the industrial courtyard. It also includes a streetcar, which is really kind of an interesting thing because back in the 1950s, they were talking about a streetcar as well. Ah, there we are. So we, we added the Falk Company and Sendix, Northside Lumber. We added a newspaper stand, and that's going to be your, actually a very key little piece of the puzzle uh, for our themes as they are developed. Right now we're starting with the entertainment theme. We also added a car barn so that the streetcar had kind of a place to live. But what's most interesting to me is, is, is the two murals that we added. Um, I had a wonderful, wonderful time working with our artist, Tom, uh, rather Tom and Art Shea, and Art Shea really spent the time to really bring Milwaukee to life. He and I went through a number of photographs, different talks about how some of these things should be put together, but the interpretation is his and he really pulled it off. He made a wonderful side street scene and to me the park scene is the quintessential Milwaukee park. As you can see, our new units and uh, you did see them a little earlier, but the murals, again, the, the added material, changing the position of the fountain, adding the lighting, just really makes them very dramatic and it carries you into the streets, but it also gives you the idea that things go beyond the streets, that there's more, something more. And then our streetcar, while it's not an exact streetcar, and I really do wanna stress that to everyone, we did not go for making an exact streetcar. We are using the streetcar as a device to bring you into the space. It's a way to awaken your memory and to put you in the mood. So you're going to come into the space with the idea that uh, in a very subliminal way, you've seen the video that goes with it and you already have it in your head when you step off of that car that you're in another time, another place. So a lot of the new interpretation that goes along with this, it really does get deep in selecting new objects that are tied to our themes. And our themes for the, uh, for the streets of old Milwaukee for the foreseeable future are entertainments, public safety, public health, and immigration. What we tried to do was select themes that were important then as well as important to us now. Every one of these themes has an echo in today's, uh, in today's society. So we were speaking directly, and all of these characters, we developed a number of characters, and with our uh, entertainment theme, we started with a, uh, a young man who works for the uh, uh, streetcar company but loves his Saturday night dancing, and a young woman then who also has aspirations to be on the stage, and then one of our solid citizens, a, a wonderful German-American socialite who will tell you all about uh, local theater and, uh, and the Germanic heritage of Milwaukee with regard to entertainments. Access is going to be by smartphones, which is really kind of something innovative. I don't think any other museum has ever has done this as yet in this particular style, developing these themes and characters and all the deepness that goes with that. So you'll be able to read the material, but what's really fun about it is you're going to be able to download it, get it set up, put the earplugs in your ears, and walk the streets arm in arm with one of our characters. We're also using a lot of social media. I've been working with our uh, public relations people with regard to Facebook, and we also have our educators that are doing a wonderful uh, Twitter reenactment that is coming up this Friday. So if you do have a Twitter account, you've got to follow the museum on Friday because we'll be talking about the 1892 Third Ward fire. And again, all, many objects are tied to these particular themes. When we talk about public health, the little meter on the side that you see there, that's a Badger meter. That is from 1905, the year that that company was founded and the year that they really started putting out this kind of device to help the city of Milwaukee monitor water and be able to make sure that people got clean water. And then in the next frame, there's, oh, we have a number of uh, little bits and pieces. There's a souvenir book from the Pabst uh, company. And 
and there's a picture of our local bicycle club. So all of these will talk about the different kinds of entertainments. So here we are, it's about 14 months later, and the streets renovation is nearly complete. Uh, we have a few little things to dust up and little pieces to put together, but largely on Friday, we're ready to go, December 11th. Uh, there's been a lot of testing and uh, developing the themes for entertainment. Um, we've got our characters set, and we have over 170 new objects in the exhibit itself. And we're going to continue testing all of this material. We're just not going to kind of let this lay. Everything is going to be adjusted. And so your input is going to be very important for us as we go along developing more characters. Um, as usual, we're very excited, uh, and the period and the collections and everything that goes along with that is just so Milwaukee, and it's so Milwaukee Public Museum. And it's just one of those things that makes the streets of old Milwaukee it just a real tradition in local history, and it, it's going to be a cutting-edge gallery at the same time. So we really have a refreshed streets of old Milwaukee, and it's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's clean, it's... It's, it just feels good again. You know, you just don't walk in there and look at it and go, wow, it's tired. I know, I dare anyone to say that right now. <laughs> but one thing I would like to do is we had a magnificent staff, and that's something that Dennis brought up just a little bit earlier. Um, so many people worked on this, so many that I can't even name them all. But right here in front of you, this is our core team, Julian, obviously our designer. Um, I'd like to thank Emilio and Art, Craig, Wendy, Rick, Nancy, Maddie, Nora, oh my God, <laughs> Jackie Schweitzer, I could, we could not have made it through this process without Jackie, without a doubt. Um, and then our PR and marketing people just keeping us on track and really doing a great job of handling neophytes like me when it comes to PR. Um, and then we had our collections people and interns and everyone else. So this really is a group effort. This is a whole museum effort. And I really want you to all understand that and really know that. So every staff member here had play, has played a part, even many of our volunteers and our docents as well. I mean, the information they've all contributed is really very important to us all. And um, I guess that takes me to the end of the history portion of this little thing. I had our mini facts up a little earlier. Hopefully we can reuse that again. But one of the really cool things that I found was the idea that the cat in the Eschweiler house was a museum pet, which struck me as, a, as very interesting. I mean, we didn't just keep a lion on the roof. We had a kitty cat in the hall. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll turn you over now to Julian Jackson. Well, I'm Julian Jackson, and uh, Al has carried, um, had given, given a little perspective on the history of things. I'm the new guy, so uh, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of perspective um, on some of the new ways that we approached uh, this particular exhibit. And I wanted to start with just a little bit of a story about uh, how I came here. Um, I grew up in Chicago, so I have been to the uh, Milwaukee Public Museum on numerous occasions as a child, but I hadn't been back in a very long time. Um, however, I'd even written in papers before about the idea of immersive exhibits and talked about the snake button. The idea that these little touches can sometimes pull you into an otherwise static exhibit. So when, I saw, uh, so when I saw the opportunity to come up and interview for um, the Milwaukee Public Museum position, uh, I thought, wow, I remember that exhibit. I wonder, I wonder if those exhibits are still there. And I wrote in my cover letter, I was like, you know, I even remember this snake button that was up there. Well, little did I know that that's what every single uh, Yelp review and Yahoo review out there says the same thing. I love the snake button. And, and it's still there. But that wasn't the end of my experience there. Dr. Ellen Sinsky, as part of my interview process, walked me into uh, the streets. And we stood approximately right here next to the pump. And she said, well, you know, one of the projects that's coming up, this was last summer, not the one just previous, but uh, 2014, walked me into the street, stood me right here and said, 
One of the projects we're thinking about doing is refurbishing the streets of old Milwaukee. I want you to walk through here, take maybe 15, 20 minutes, and tell me what you think you would do with this space if we were to hire you. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And she started to turn, and then she turned back to me and said, and you probably should know that this is the most popular exhibit in Milwaukee. And if you were to screw this up, <laughs> be driven out of town. Well, the other day, I was going through some of my, uh, my piles of paper. My office is kind of a mess. I, I usually like to keep it pretty neat, but it's a mess right now at the end of a project. And I found the notes from that day. These are little pieces of paper that I ripped out of my tiny little notebook and brought down here. And I just wanted to read you a few of the things that are on this because uh, you can see a few remnants of that original brainstorm, that 20 minute brainstorm inspired by Ellen here uh, in the current streets. So I have things that say, no screens, tech hidden, yellow lights only. Um, there were a lot of blue, more modern looking lights that had crept into the streets recently, and it was sort of losing that gaslit feel uh, to it. Um, details, sawdust, fake horse dung. Yeah, we considered that. Uh, a Trump Deloy mural near Granny, um, which you know, Al talked about the murals that were there. Um, Ghosts of Old Milwaukee app. That's not the direction we went, but we were thinking about that. Shadow play inside the windows. Um, a sophisticated soundscape, horse clops, motor car, crickets. Uh, a newspaper kiosk, subtle way to express location and date. Slight movements in the lights. Um, anyway, so I, I'm happy to show these to anybody who's curious about it, but there were a number of things that suggested themselves immediately about the streets because it was obvious that this was an immersive environment from the very beginning. I was walking into not just a traditional exhibit, but a place that people lived. They got inside and they pretended like they were back in turn of the century Milwaukee. And so anything that I wanted to do in this space needed to honor the original character of the streets, needed to honor what people loved about the streets originally. So all my newfangled ways and uh, ideas needed to align with what visitors wanted and loved about it. Well, that eventually boiled down to a series of principles, of design principles. We wanted to take people on a journey back in time. And that was one of the critical elements. And I'll read you one more note from my, uh, from my notes here. Entrance, discovery, like the Narnian wardrobe. Anyone here ever read the Narnia series? In any story where people go back in time or to another world, there's always a device in there. It's Doctor Who's police box or the Narnian wardrobe or something like that. So the streets giving them some sort of new entrance way which ended up being the streetcar, uh, seemed like the right thing from the very beginning. So a journey back in time. Don't just assume that you step out of the lobby and into a new environment. Take them on a journey. We wanted to do many characters and many stories. As I began to talk with Al about this, there were just so many stories. It was like, how do we fit this in this space without it becoming just placards of text? Or kiosk with a bunch of talking heads. How do we tell all of these different stories all of the, uh, highlight all of these different themes without ruining the character of it. But we wanted to include many characters and many stories. We also wanted to include new things to explore. In addition to my own brainstorms, the team had a bunch of new ideas about what we could add to the, uh, to the streets. We wanted to engage all of the senses. The idea of immersion does not, ex uh, does not limit itself to just the things that you see. It has to do with the things that you touch, the things that you smell, not horse dung, uh, <laughs> the things that you hear. So we wanted to engage all of the senses. And we wanted to continue that tradition of those hidden delights, those Easter eggs throughout it. That's a tradition that's been uh, with the um, Milwaukee Public Museum since long before I came here, including that snake button. 
So Al gave you a bunch of the history, and I'll highlight some specific ways we address these. But I wanted to particularly focus on the how. How did we do these things? Give you a little insight into particularly the design team's process behind this. The streetcar was a very pretty early idea. Um, Al and I were talking in one of our early conversations, and um, he was talking about transportation, that there was a lot of changeover in transportation, new methods, new ideas, new ways that things were going. And he mentioned the streetcars. And that, like, that was like a light bulb going on. It's like, that's it. Our Narnian wardrobe will be a streetcar. So that idea was very, very early on in the process. And you can see it in some of the earliest sketches that we did. Um, and I need to say, I had a lot of bad ideas early on in this. Um, and you can see that we were trying to fit a lot of stuff into some very small areas. Um, I, actually, I, I tried to look for some of my really worst ideas, and I think maybe one day in a fit of peak, I purged a bunch of them. But I did discover a few ones. Um, we were going to try to move some of these dioramas around, and that ended up just being a logistical nightmare. So uh, there was one small diorama that we ended up um, losing. It was of a uh, French person and Native American hunting a deer. Um, not the most beloved one, but we ended up having to uh, eliminate that in, in the process. It was perhaps one of the very few things that went. But we're trying to figure out how to fit the streetcar in, how to fit new buildings in, how to fit in uh, elements behind the scenes. Well, that developed a little bit. Streetcars are above uh, level. I was trying to figure out how do we make this accessible to everybody. Streetcars are something you step up into. Uh, and. Um, we were trying to figure out how do we include ramps so that anyone and everyone can get into the streetcar. That became an important component with us. You know, could a curve around the front? That was a terrible idea, but <laughs> uh, you can see sort of a iteration of that here. Finally, we settled on a design. Uh, you can see the results in the actual streets, and Al showed a final blueprint a little while later. And we began on the basic wall construction. But I wanted to show you this uh, little behind the scenes uh, thing. We had a party in the space. Once we had uh, demoed the whole space and cleared it, we had a party in the space. And as part of it, as part of this sense that this all belongs to all of us, everyone in the museum who came signed the, this pillar. This pillar is sort of nestled in the walls there. But there's all sorts of predictions about, you know, Packer Super Bowls and uh, and who will be the president in whatever year and all sorts of stuff. So this is a little bit of a time machine that's nestled within the streets itself. And so the next uh, designer and curator that go through the streets will discover this and have a good laugh at all of our mis uh, predictions. But the process sort of began moving from sort of the flat footprint of what the streets were to raising those buildings. As um, community members stepped forward to sponsor different things, we began to design individual buildings. We had to look at the facades. We had to look at the materials we were using, the colors, uh, the graphic design for all of these things. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was stay true to the original designer's intents to use original materials. You'll see in the streets that we use Cream, uh, cream City brick that we pulled uh, off of buildings. Um, this design in particular is of uh, Northside Lumber, now known as Blifford Lumber. And the entire interior of this particular uh, building is done in the wood that was pulled off of the original office, this beautiful gnarled pine wood that you really can't find anywhere in, uh, anymore. We wanted to use those original materials. Um, oh, incidentally, I'll just point over here. This was my, uh, my very quickly made um, uh, foam core model, just making sure that we had all our sight lines and everything. Uh, you can peek at that a little bit later. So the walls continued to go up throughout the space. We made other foam core models of some of the spaces in the original streets, trying to think of how we would incorporate physical objects with the murals. Again, this idea of immersion was very important. The murals were an excellent addition, and I'm glad that, uh, that Art kind of called out the background. But also thinking about how we made it feel like it would continue on. So the fence drawn into the, uh, the piece there, the, the police sentry box there in the front. 
um, you'll notice in the streets themselves, and I actually don't think I have a picture of this in uh, my slideshow, but there is a moon up above uh, to, that sort of adds into the whole piece. So all of this layers of different people's skill sets to create the overall illusion of being back in time. Um, most people work with me know that I have a fondness for quotes for people. Uh, Picasso has a quote that art is, a, uh, art is a lie that tells the truth. And to me, that's a lot of what we were about in this. We were trying to create illusions um, that really cre uh, created a sense of what actually was at one time. Here's a number of our crew members uh, putting up the star wall at the end of the street uh, near the bakery. Um, we had our planetarium director sort of lay out the individual stars so they're accurate to that part of the sky. A little compressed, three-quarter scale as it were, but, um, but they're putting up the star wall in this folk picture. Uh, we continued to sort of model the thing. This, these are some close-ups of this model uh, that I have on the other side of the stage with me. That model, the uh, fiber, uh, sorry, the foam core model moved into 3D design. And a lot of what we're looking at when we're in this stage are sight lines, making sure that there's enough space for folks to get through, um, working out um, traffic patterns, working out where individual things were. And while we were staying pretty true to the original vision uh, that was laid down on paper a little while ago, when we got in a little bit deeper, we made some different choices. You'll see that the Schlimmer automobile was originally slated for being in that upfront portion. It has now moved deeper into the exhibit and has its own garage uh, a little bit deeper into the exhibit. And the place where the uh, Schlimmer is pictured in this particular one is now um, Northside Lumber. You'll see a corner of the, uh, the newsstand in the lower right as well. The construction of the streetcar began in earnest. Uh, we partnered with Zibitz. They have a presence here in, in Milwaukee, but also uh, have their construction uh, primary facility in Grand Rapids uh, just across the lake. And we were working with all of the colors. We pulled from color books that were original Victorian color books for as much of the color as we could. Again, um, history staff being invaluable in helping us do this research, staying true wherever possible uh, to original intent. And we did use some original blueprints of streetcars to create as close a facsimile. Uh, Al pointed out that we couldn't do a replica but we wanted to stay as true to it as possible while still making it a comfortable entrance for everybody who moved through. We also began working on some animations which would populate the streetcar. Uh, inside the streetcar, we wanted this to be a journey through time. So inside the streetcar, behind the windows, are buildings that start in the 1900 in the evening and move uh, towards the entrance and they modernize as they go. So as you walk into the streets, you're walking backwards in time. You start in 2015, you move backward to the 1950s, then you move into the 1910, and you exit into the t uh, street's time period. So those are moving by you as you enter the streetcar. There's a rumble underneath the floor, there's street names being called out, the ding ding of the trolley bell. So it's a very immersive environment. But again, we didn't want to make the technology the key thing. This was about the experience. It's hard to talk more about the streets since I want you all to experience the streets because it is a multi-layered uh, experience with sound, smell, touch, other components. But we did want to talk a little bit more about some of these techniques. And Al mentioned briefly this idea of an app uh, that you can download for your phone. This really was about that idea of many characters, many stories. All of the rich history that Al was imparting to me as we were having these early conversations, like how in the world do we tell all of these stories? But what we decided eventually were some things that I think are gonna continue the history of innovation that we have here at the Milwaukee Public Museum with an app and an exhibit that change over time. These different themes will be rotated approximately every half year. We're starting with entertainment, as Al uh, alluded to, with uh, several different characters that you can follow through the streets. But then, not only will the app 
change, but these other components, the headlines and the newsstand, will change regularly. This gives us the opportunity to highlight different characters, different perspectives, different themes of things that are going on uh, over that period of time. But the app really is the core of that. Um, and with each one of the apps, we, uh, Al did a bunch of research into different characters. We created composite characters that might represent different perspectives on each one of uh, these themes. Um, and Al you know, uh, illuminated some of what those are. But over time, as we hit each one of these different themes, we're going to be able to cover a lot of different kinds of people, different social classes, different cultures, different ages. Uh, different genders, different perspectives on what it was like to live in uh, Milwaukee at that time. And that collection of perspectives is really uh, a great way to go at history, in my opinion. Uh, that's always my favorite history, when I can find um, things that are close to people's perspectives on it at that time, and then compare and contrast them against people who disagreed with them sometimes. I mean, that's a wonderful way to sort of bring history to life, and that's part of what The Streets is about. Now, developing an app is a little bit different. You probably heard in my introduction that I do have some background not only in exhibits, but also in uh, digital design as well. And so thinking through the flow of something like this uh, looks very complicated, but the objective here is to make it as simple as possible. The objective with this app is really that you open it up, does require you that your Bluetooth is on and give you instructions on how to do that. Choose the character you want to follow, and hopefully you have, have, have headphones. You can read it if you want, but the best experience is with headphones. Plug it in and put it away, and you never have to touch it again. It uses beacons to track you through the exhibit. Basically, it knows where you are. So if you're following our vaudevillian through the streets, she says, oh, I want to check the newsstand. I think my ad for my new performance is in there. You walk over, she'll talk a little bit about her performance at the Majestic Theater that's coming up, and then say, well, walk with me a little bit uh, uh, further, down to Granny's house. And then she'll talk about teaching Granny's granddaughter um, some music as one of her part-time side jobs. But it won't trigger until it detects that you're in that zone. The idea here is to use technology, and this is what the theme that we use throughout the streets. Use technology, but push it into the background. It is serving the experience, it is not the experience. Uh, we wanted to hide it as much as possible. The headphones were another little bit of a, a challenging decision for us because requiring headphones was, you know, do we want to require that everybody use headphones? And yet the idea of that audio kind of spilling into the environment from everybody using them would have overwhelmed this. And it's my hope that if you choose not to use this app at all, if you don't have headphones, if you don't want to use any of these components, it's still a rich enough experience with all the other stories, all the other elements that are in there that you can engage with the streets in a variety of different ways. This is a uh, map of all the different beacons throughout the space that allows us as much flexibility as possible. And we built a back end onto this application so that we can create new stories, either in this space or, and uh, our IES director, who is also very critical in this, Greg Post, made sure that the, uh, our contracts read that we own the code behind this. So if this works well, if this is a good way to tell stories, we can deploy this in other venues as well. The idea of as seamless a storytelling possibility as, as we can. This will be available for download. I think we're turning the switch on on Thursday night, but you should be able to download it at home. There will be links on the website. Uh, Google Play Store, iTunes Store, you can get it a variety of different places. Um, and you can download it here, you can download it at home, and then use it here. I also wanted to highlight some of the other process that we went through. There is a very sophisticated soundscape throughout the uh, exhibit. Um, we used way more speakers than would be necessary to simply fill the space with sound because we wanted it to be directional sound. We wanted it to be subtle sound. We wanted it to be sound that may just be a cricket uh, chirping in a corner because that would add to the depth of the immersion in the space. 
we worked a lot with uh, Tanner Monagle, which is a local firm here, and they kind of went above and beyond to do just great sound design, to work with us in recording the people who are going to be in the apps, to record conversations that you can listen to if you put your ear against some of the windows, uh, to create the sounds um, that you might hear at that time period. There's another element, and this, I, I need to confess, I just blatantly stole a lot of these techniques from Disney. Um, we did a lot of green screen work, but you won't see the screens obviously placed anywhere in the streets. Uh, I mentioned earlier the streetcar and those, these, it, it's the opposite of aging. Is there a word that says like growing newer? That's a simple active verb. Uh, Benjamin buttoning? Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, retrograding. Okay, that works. Anyway, as these buildings grow newer, we used a lot of the folks who are already uh, docents and volunteers within our space, and we did green screen filming with them in period costume. So they're in the streets. They're populating the streets uh, that are going by you as you enter. But you'll also see a number of them in other locations within the streets. If you happen to look up at Miss Kitty's window above the saloon, you might catch a glimpse of, a sha of her shadow as she puts the final touches on her hair. Or if you happen to peek through the doorway of the Fister, you may see uh, the lobby inside. And you can see that the, uh, the, um, a waiter and a maid are having a discussion there. Well, we did this against green screen and then we're able to sort of merge that with the Fister lobby. Um, behind that. So there's little bits of this life uh, embedded in the streets, and I hope that you find it subtle and yet compelling. Here's a picture of the uh, finished new square up here. Wow, that looks really clean. <laughs> and um, I do just want to invite you to really explore the streets, because that final element, that painting in the corners that everyone, everyone involved in this project did. The details are so deep that you can come back again and again to discover new things. Um, but we did insert a number of uh, elements that are very much like the snake button, interactive components that you can uh, engage with. Al mentioned the uh, museum cat. Well, there is yet another cat in the streets uh, that may yowl at you from between the buildings. So I'm going to give you the challenge to find the cat uh, within that space. But there's other interactive components. Uh, engage with it. Go deep, because I think you'll be rewarded in there. I think we have some time for some questions for Al and I. Uh, I just wanted to invite those questions. And yeah. Ah, okay. Why don't you come on up, Al, just in case some of these, um, so we'll share this duty. Uh, <laughs> well, the name of the particular type of speakers that are attached to the bottom of it are, are colloquially called butt kickers. <laughs> They're used in video gaming. So if you're like a really intense video gaming, you buy these speakers and you put them underneath your chair, and then when you blow up you know, the Death Star or something, it goes boom and shakes everything. Well, that's what we're using essentially to create the soundtrack. So there really is a ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum which gives a slight shudder on your feet. Shouldn't be enough to throw anyone's balance off, but it's enough to fool you a little bit that it's actually moving. Uh, yes, sir. We have inexpensive headphones that are being sold in, it's the one nod to modernity uh, that's gonna be in the Haymarket, which is still there. Your old favorites are all still there. There'll be headphones sold there uh, inexpensively down in the shop below. And we will have these signs on our website, down in the concourse as to how to download all of this. We're gonna put instructions wherever we can possibly put it. And again, even if you don't catch it the first time, this is a very rich experience. So we hope people will enjoy it with or without the headphones. I saw a question. Yes, sir. Is this designed to be a one-way? I would say it's best because we hope everybody comes through this. But uh, you know, as designers, we know that people you know go uh, back and forth. 
during the member preview, something I noticed happened, and this was, an, uh, again, an element that, as a designer, I, I, I try to predict what people's behavior is going to be as best we can, but we can't always predict it. A lot of people would come through the streetcar, go all the way into Harnish Fagers and uh, the Haymarket, and there's an exit right there, but they would turn around and come all the way back and walk back through the streetcar because I think they wanted to see more. And there certainly is a lot of richness to uh, engage with. Ma'am? Yeah, you mentioned the snake. Well, the snake button, so you, you need to just catch a child who's going through the museum because they all know. Well, your, your childhood was bereft then. The, the, it's up at the buffalo hunt on the second floor. And uh, an educator had this idea that to sort of surprise and delight the school children that they were uh, interacting with, they uh, built a rattlesnake, which is in the grass right there. And there's a little button hidden in the rocks that if you press it, the rattlesnake goes brrrr. And it's such a subtle thing. It's such a subtle idea. But it really does add a whole new dimension because uh, it kind of grabs your attention and pulls you into this static exhibit. Is there anything else about the history of that? Did I capture the history of yeah, that correctly? I think you covered that good. Okay. Very well. Ma'am? What are the butterfly worms? <laughs> uh, so what she is referring to is uh, there might be a little jar on this cart right here that if you tap the lid, uh, there's a butterfly that flies around it. And no, it's not a real butterfly. We don't do that to butterflies here. Um, we put them in much, much larger glass boxes at the, at the front. Um, the butterfly work, it's essentially on a tension wire. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, this was something that we found and purchased. We did not invent this one. Uh, for it, actually, um, again, Doug Post was looking around, and I think he was the one that found this. Anyway, if you tap the top of the jar, the tension wire just uh, loosens just enough that the butterfly goes <laughs> around the jar like that, and we get some oohs and ahs from that one. There is a little bit of a history to that, though. Uh, when we were working with the uh, uh, folks from Sendix, one of the things that the family members did tell us is that old Salvatore, uh, as he would get fruit from the local vendors uh, and he'd go through the boxes, he would find little critters, the periodic spider or bat or something like that, and he would then put them in a jar or a box and he would keep them with him on, at the cart. Uh, well, some of those are purchased. Some of those come from our botany department and our uh, fruit and vegetable models. Um, this is a little bit of a test. We may need to eventually just try a slightly different technique because you can go in there and you can feel those. And they did a marvelous job in the modeling and the uh, development of those. But some of those are historic mo uh, botany models and some are a little bit more modern. It's kind of a combination between the two. Ma'am? Well, this is my first. <laughs> uh, well, let me address that for just, just one second. Um, we've had a couple people say, and you know, I, I think this is a great turnout. I'm told this is a great turnout for these, uh, and that there's a huge amount of love for the streets. But my interaction so far in Milwaukee has been there's a huge amount of love for this museum. And that I think we're going to, you know, the talent in this museum, this, this, the reason I came here is the vision that Dennis is bringing, uh, the people that are here. We can do anything here. That, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be, you know, bragging about it, but the people here are amazing. And I think we're going to do just some other great things with this. Uh, this increased my trust in my teammates that we really can accomplish some other wonderful, wonderful things. And when we do those, I certainly hope we do a few more of these behind the scenes lectures. Do you want to say anything? Oh, okay. No, I'm good. Right. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I guess I could. <laughs> um, the safe actually belonged to the old museum library building. And it came over here in 1985 after languishing in the old building, building across Wells Street for many, many years. 
nobody ever opened that thing. And what they were able to do, what we were able to do this time around with the help of a locksmith is we actually found uh, inside a very usual and typical type of booby trap that was used to defer criminals from uh, getting into the safe. And it was, uh, it was still intact, but we, we had our hazmat people here and it was so deteriorated, it was really nothing. But it was removed, but I did keep the original exterior packaging, the actual metal case for it. And that I did place back in the safe. So if you look very carefully down the bottom of uh, the uh, uh, lumber yard uh, and look into the safe through the... Uh, uh, through the counter, you can just get a glimpse of the uh, uh, booby trap. We hope you'll enjoy your exhibit. Thanks for coming. An MCM production. <laughs>